Right. So today will be, will be my last lecture, actually. Um, and I will mainly talk about, uh, I chose finally to talk about uh, record statistics for random walks. Uh, I will just leave these uh, records for IID. But before I leave it completely, I just want to remind you the main result that, uh, main results, actually, uh, that we obtained yesterday. So we were looking at these records uh, for IID sequences. So that means that you consider a set of random variables, x1, x2, xn, and I just want to see this index again, xi or xk, as a time index, having in mind that this could represent a sort of discrete time series. And the first object that uh, we have computed, uh, considering the case where these random variables are actually continuous and also symmetric, Yes, I need symmetric also. Um, so first thing that we computed is the probability that the record is broken at step k, so the probability that the record happens at step k, and this is what I would like to call, uh, I mean, usually called the record rate, I'm not sure I really mentioned it yesterday, which I denoted rk, which was the absolute value of, uh, sorry, the average value of this uh, indicator variable sigma k, and we computed it and uh, realized that this is just one over k. We did one, concrete calculation with that to obtain it, and we also gave a very simple argument uh, to obtain it directly. And from it, we could obtain the, the then essentially the, the, the rest of the, of the lecture was devoted to the statistics of the number of records, uh, which I denoted by Rn. We first got immediately, the, we first obtained immediately the average number of, of, uh, of these uh, record numbers uh, as being simply the sum of this record rate from k equal one to n, and this is just this harmonic number. And uh, in the large n limit, uh, this sum of one over k uh, is well known to behave as log n. And then uh, we did uh, an additional computation to get the rn square. And there, uh, this, this was actually more involved because uh, we had to show that uh, the, essentially the record rates uh, at different times are independent, that means that Basically, the pro I mean, the, 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 this, the, the two following events, which are having a records at step k and having another record at step k prime, uh, turned out to be actually uh, linearly independent. Uh, this, uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, so precisely because it's inside, uh, we need to consider these correlations, thank you. And we show indeed that they are uh, decoupled, I mean, at least uh, linearly uh, independent. And I told you that this is actually a more general result uh, for variables which are uh, exchangeables. It doesn't have to do uh, with really the independence of it. And eventually we find this, uh, this, uh, that this variance itself uh, also uh, behaves like log n. And uh, finally, uh, so typically, I mean, that means with these two values, typically, I mean, that means that if I look at the probability that Rn is equal to m as a function of m here, so it will be, okay, centered around the average value, which is log n, and the width will be the square root of this quantity, which is namely square root of log n. So what you see here is that, um, that the, if you look at the relative fluctuations, uh, you see that they tend to go to zero, right, in the sense that the, the width, uh, divided by uh, the typical value uh, goes to zero as one over square root of log n, okay? So that means that the, the records, the number of records, I mean, tend to be extremely peaked, more and more peaked if you want, uh, around, around this value. Now, uh, I also uh, did the computation, which I have not uh, reminded here, uh, to make a link between the, the distribution of the number of records and the distribution of the number of cycles within uh, random permutation, okay, I discussed quickly these uh, Stirling numbers that count these cycles within a given permutation, okay, uh, and then eventually, uh, I didn't show you how, how to do that, but eventually one, one can get uh, the, the, this, uh, this Gaussian behavior. So eventually, the, the distribution of this Rn equal to m, at least the typical values of it, uh, will be uh, a Gaussian centered around log n with a width proportional to square root of log n. 
Okay, so now, uh, today what I want to, so okay, one, I mean, just one thing that, that one has to, to, of course, to keep in mind is that you see that in all these results, finally the, the P of X, that means the, the, the initial PDF of the X size actually does not enter, it has actually completely disappeared. So in other words, uh, this statistics of records for IID is completely universal. And in fact, one way to do, to do it, uh, I didn't present it like, like this because it's a bit technical, but one way to do that is to show directly that the records, I mean, can be mapped directly to this problem of random permutation, and the problem of random permutation uh, is just universal. I mean, does not depend on, uh, uh, on, on, on any P of X. So that's the case for IID. It's uh, perfectly well understood, although there, there are many, I mean, the, the, the mathematical structure is not that, that simple. Uh, but so now today I would like to show you how, how to look at this, 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 uh, the same problem, but in the case where the X size here are the positions of a random walker after step I, okay? And in fact, uh, what I want to show you is that we already have all the, the tools to do that. Uh, essentially, the survival probability that we have computed, and in particular this par Andersen theorem, will be extremely helpful to do that. The only thing that we need to do is to formulate properly the, 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 the problem, and that's what, uh, that's what we will do today, okay? So uh, let's start with uh, uh, this. So again, uh, the, the idea is to look at uh, some record statistics of strongly correlated set of um, random variables. Uh, again, I didn't mention here uh, what would be the record statistics of weakly correlated random variables, like for instance an einstein bullenbeck process, but basically um, at large time, the statistics of records for IAD sequence, for a weakly correlated sequence, with say correlations that decay exponentially, would eventually converge to the, to these uh, uh, records for IAD sequences. One can construct uh, an argument similar to the one that I showed you last time for the extremes. Uh, and then, uh, so that's why we need to consider something which are, I mean, some sets of variables which are strongly correlated, and uh, the simplest and certainly the most relevant example uh, is the case of random walks. So, I will not, uh, we have already studied this, uh, this random walks quite a bit, and uh, that means that I will again study this kind of, uh, of, of Markov, Markov model, so I will start at zero, and uh, I will uh, evolve uh, according to this, uh, to this Markov chain, okay? And these eta n's are the germs, and uh, the p of eta, so the eta n's are iid random variables, and p of eta, as it is there, I will take it as continuous and symmetric, and probably I will also comment a little bit on what happens. Uh, on what happens if you, for instance, have a linear drift. But what is important is that I will just, just consider uh, jumps which might be, uh, which, have, which might have a thin tail, like an exponential or exponential tail, exponential or Gaussian tail. But I will also include in the study, I will actually also include the case of uh, Levy random walks, uh, Levy flights, say, uh, which corresponds to the case where this P of eta uh, have a power law uh, distributions. Okay, and we will see, we have already seen that we know all this uh, machinery of uh, first passage properties for all these uh, these uh, families of uh, jump distributions. So you will see that um, we, we will apply it, uh, of course, of course here. So how does it look like? So typically, I mean, I will have this kind of um, I will have this kind of uh, of sequence. Um, okay, so let's just. Uh, Okay, draw it. So I will start at zero. Okay, so let me start here at zero, uh, as we did, uh, as we did, uh, and then I will just evolve uh, with this uh, with this kind of jumps. Okay, so I could have this something like this. Uh, then I will do that. Uh, then I will do this. For instance, then I could do that. I could do this. I could do that. Okay, so that's typically uh, the kind of uh, chain that I would have. 
So I will consider the case where I have n steps. So if I have n steps, uh, one should remember that since I, I, I start at x0, if I have n steps, I will have n plus one random variable, okay, x0, x1, x2, xn, so n plus one random variable. And uh, where are the records? So typically I will, it's a convention, I will consider, I will assume that the first one is a record, okay, by convention. So this one is one record. Uh, where are the other records? Uh, this is another one. Uh, then this is obviously another record. And this one is another record. Okay, so here I would have, I would have again, I will use the same notation. Uh, I will have Rn equal to a four here, okay? So again, I would like to say something about the, 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 the statistics of the number of records. Okay, so let's try to focus on that. And if I have time, I will also try to say something about the, the ages of the record. You remember that, that that was another observable that we were interested in? But let's try to uh, focus on the, on, the, on the number of records for this. For this uh <clears throat> yes? That's true, so indeed. Uh, right. You mean in, st in here? Okay, so here I really consider the fact, okay, so you have discrete steps, right? So this is just one step. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Sorry, it was not very clear. Is that clear then? Is that clear for everybody? Okay. Fine. So let's let's try to, to look at first the, the statistics of the... Uh, of Rn. So I will do exactly as I did before. So I will introduce this. Uh, so let's first look at the statistics of Rn. As we did before, uh, I will introduce uh, this variable sigma k, which is one if xk is a record and zero otherwise. Okay? And again, uh, I will just use the same trick, I mean, not trick, but just rewriting of Rn as the sum of this uh, random variable. Okay, so now I, I will start at zero because uh, the convention is that is we usually start at x naught, or at least that's my convention. Okay, so by definition, Rn is that. And again, uh, if I want to compute the average, so let's, when I say statistics, let's start with the first, first moment, and let's try to compute Rn, averaged. Okay, so this will be again uh, this, this quantity. Uh, let me call it Rk. And Rk, okay, let's, sorry, let's do it this way again. Sigma k, and yesterday I convinced you that this is just the probability to observe a record at step k, okay? So this is just uh, this guy. <coughs> at step k, so this is just rk, and rk is the probability, again, that xk is a record. So now, so let's try to compute uh, this, this object, okay? <clears throat> so let's look at this uh, picture here, and let's suppose that, okay, we would like to compute the probability to have, say, a record here at step k. First observation, as we did yesterday, the probability to observe a, a record here, of course, is completely independent of what happens uh, afterwards, okay? So let me just focus on this part here, okay? So I will just uh, erase this, uh, the rest. And I will just focus on this. So I, I look, I'm looking at this sequence here. Again, at start, basically at start at zero. And uh, just 
go a little bit further. And for the sake of uh, clarity uh, of, the, of, the, of, of the explanation of, of the reasoning, let's suppose that this, re this record is broken at a given value y. So I will first try to compute the probability that the, the, the record is broken at step k with some value y, and eventually I will have to integrate over y from 0 to plus infinity. Okay? Now, what do I do? So again, I want to compute this probability that I start at 0 and that I arrive at y here at step k for the first time because it's a record, okay? So that means that all these values here, they need to stay below this value y, okay? So let's try, let, let me do a transformation that we, that we have already uh, done several times. I will first change the, the origin the, the, of, of space. So I will move, I have, my origin is here, so I will just say, okay, let's try to have this origin there, okay? I just can move move this, and I can do that because the brand new, I mean, the random walk is just invariant uh, under translation. So I first do that, so uh, essentially what I'm doing is that uh, I will just take this, this, this will be my, my new uh, y uh, origin, so this is one, this will now be some dotted line. Okay, so that means that now, so this will be zero here, and this will just be minus y. Okay. Now here uh, I am actually uh, doing uh, something. Uh, I mean, my random walk is symmetric. The jumps are symmetric. Okay. Uh, so that means that I can just uh, reverse basically uh, here. I mean, I can e easily reverse uh, reverse time. So instead of going in that direction, okay, uh, I will do. I will go in the other direction. Okay. So I will just choose my uh, origin to be here, okay? So that will be my new origin. And I will say that here, now, uh, so I erase this guy. So I change the origin, essentially, from this point to that point, okay? So that's my new origin. I didn't change the, this, this arrow here, but I just changed the arrow of time can do that because the random walk is just symmetric. So now you see what, uh, what you have to compute. You have to compute the, so this, the probability that this, this is a record is basically the probability at, at, at a given which, at a given level y. I reformulate it as the probability for a random walk to start at zero, arrive at minus y after k steps, and staying positive, staying negative uh, between step zero and step k, okay? So now, eventually, I need to integrate over all the positive value of y. That means all the negative value of minus y. So what I am actually computing is just the survival probability, which is the probability that my random walk, starting at zero, stays negative up to state k. Well, I don't need here to reverse it, and I don't want to do that because I want to have a framework that also allows me to treat non-symmetric work. Okay, so if you have, for instance, a drift, then if I start to, to reverse it, that will be the survival probability on the positive axis, but then I would need also to change the sign of the drift, and I don't want to do that. I just want to stick to this. Okay, so that's the probability. So I hope, so this transformation here is just to convince you that Rk, uh, this is something that I will call here Q minus K. And this is just the survival probability on the negative axis. So that's, that's what exactly. So that's the probability that X1 uh, is negative, X2 is negative up to, step, uh, up to step K, starting at X0 equal to zero. Okay, so before we had computed the survival, so that's what I want to call the survival probability. Survival probability. Okay. On the negative axis. 
So up to now, that's true that I mainly consider the case of the survival probability on the positive axis, but up to now, I've also always considered uh, symmetric jumps. So that's the survival probability on the negative axis. Okay. Now, if the so that means that okay, if the the standard picture that uh, that I had before was more something like that. Okay. So that would be I start at zero, and uh, you want to stay negative uh, up to say uh, up to step k. But alternatively, I mean, for symmetric uh, jumps, which I am considering here, that's essentially the same as the survival probability on the positive axis, up to state k. Yeah? Well, OK, here uh, I really consider the case where uh, I am going up to step k, OK? So I want xk to be. I really want XK to be a record. OK? This K is not less than 0. I don't. I mean, he's, he, he has to be. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. They, they all need to be negative here, right? So the first one is zero, and the, all the other one has to be exactly smaller than zero. Is that fine? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at the beginning, yeah, OK. I mean, even you see immediately, OK, maybe I did, I mean, OK, I did this picture because I just wanted to illustrate that this is indeed the first passage. But that's what I meant by doing this picture, right? I mean, OK, you, maybe you saw it immediately from, from the beginning, and then it's fine. Uh, but otherwise, okay, I need it needs a little bit of construction to see precisely why this is not, and also to see clearly that you, you need you, you have to take care that this is the survival probability on the negative axis. Okay, but I agree. I mean, this is relatively standard to see. So now, uh, the thing is that we know what this uh, Q minus K here is at least for uh, for symmetric uh, random walk. So for symmetric jumps, we have already encountered uh, this quantity, right? For symmetric jumps, uh, Q minus K is something that we know. Q minus K is what I called up to, up to, I mean, up to now was just Q zero K, right? The survival probability of the random walk starting at zero up to step K, and we have seen that this observable here, this probability, uh, we could actually compute it explicitly using the Sparr-Anderson theorem, OK? And what the Sparr-Anderson theorem tells you is that this is just this guy uh, times this uh, combinatorial factor. So this is, I recall you, this Sparr-Anderson. And what is quite remarkable in this theorem is that this result here is completely independent of P of eta, OK? So this. Of course, this picture here will depend on, on the jump distributions. I mean, if you look at what, how your uh, random walk looks like, and in particular, if you have uh, heavy tails, it will look quite different. But if you look at these properties of the records, uh, that will be completely independent of the jump distribution. OK? Now, another thing that uh, we have seen is that uh, for large k, uh, this, so if you look at k larger than 1, this actually behaves like 1 over square root of pi k. Okay? So now, so this is the, uh, this is rk, right? Uh, this is the rate, this is the record rate. So the first observation is that you see that you remember that for, for IID random variable, this record rate was actually behaving like 1 over k. So that means that for random walk, it's more likely to break new records. Okay? So this should be compared uh, to uh, 1 over k for IID. Okay? 
So of course, one should expect that the, the typical or the mean number of records will be higher in this case. And this is something that we can easily evaluate, at least for large n. So now I can evaluate this Rn because this is just uh, this guy. Uh, this I know now, so this I know. And I see, uh, you see that that tells you that Rk behaves like one over square root of pi k for large, large k. So that means that in the large n limit, of course, this sum will be diverging, okay, because it decreases relatively, I mean, not too fast to converge when n goes to infinity. In other words, that means that for large n, the behavior of this sum is dominated by the large k. Okay, so that means that this is uh, essentially, uh, I can basically replace this by in the large, in the large k limit uh, by, this, uh, by this behavior, one over square root of pi k. And for large n, uh, this will, so when you formally resum this, so you will have a square root of n that will come comes out. And then uh, this actually gives you a 2 over square root of pi. Okay, so if you look at the large n limit of this sum here, there is a 2 here. I mean, it's a bit like similar to, you can, for large n, you can essentially replace this by an integral. And this, this is the origin of this factor 2 here. Okay? Of course, Okay, if you, we, we, can do, we can do better, we can do better because uh, it's possible to do this, uh, this sum explicitly. So for those of you who like uh, uh, binomial coefficients uh, and uh, gamma functions, maybe I can just you, give you uh, an explicit, uh, an explicit uh, result uh, for it, uh, if you prefer, if you feel more comfortable. Uh, there is actually an exact result. Uh, let me first give it exactly. So this is just 3 by 2 plus n divided by square root of pi uh, factorial n. And, uh, okay, let me just mention, uh, I like very much this, uh, this derivation, uh, which is actually not uh, due to myself, but let me just mention the, the name of this uh, gentleman. Uh, so this, this method actually was, was uh, I mean, this, this way of computing Rn was devised by uh, Satya Majuna and, and Bob Ziff. And this is a nice PRL from, uh, I, will, I can give you this, this is quite quite nice paper, actually. Yeah. This one? Yeah, this is for high values of K. Yes, okay, so what I said is that, um, so here, okay, uh, I was saying that, um, we know that it decays like one over square root of k. So it's clear that actually the, this sum here will be dominated by the large values of k, close to, close to uh, k close to n, okay? So that means that at leading order, I have not said, I mean, what are the remaining, uh, the, there, there will be some remi reminder here, I mean, there will be some corrections which I have not written. But to leading order, to evaluate this sum, you can just look at what happens for large k. Sorry? It's, it's governed by this because you see that uh, this sum here, you cannot put, I mean, if you formally put it, uh, and if you want to put n goes to infinity, this will, this will not converge, okay? So when you are facing such a, a sum which is uh, diverging when the uh, uh, upper bound is, is, is growing, the same for an integral, uh, that means that you are dominated by what happens for the large values, okay? So I can just discard, okay, I, can, I could do that in a, more, in a more precise way. Actually, at the end, if you really want to do nicely, that's why I, get, I, I gave you this, this formula. There is an explicit formula, and then the, the analysis is very straightforward. But it's also nice to, to see that you can just extract the leading term by looking at the behavior of, of Rk in, as, 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 as one of Rk, uh, for large k. So actually, so you, you remember that for the... IID case, we had this one over k, and again, I mean, it's clear that you are also, in that case, the series is not converging. So for IID, you are also dominated by what happens for large values of k. You have this one over k, which gives this log n. Here you have this one over square root of pi k, uh, which gives you this uh, two over square root of pi times square root of n. Okay? Uh, that 
Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. So okay, uh, you can have actually something that grows. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, for instance, if you put, I mean, one case which is relatively simple is you put a drift. So you look at this random walk and you put a negative drift, for instance. And uh, what will happen in that case is that typically your random walk, I mean, I mean, will uh, okay, it will have a certain number of records at the origin. So you're, if you put a negative drift, your random walk will just do uh, little steps here positively, and then it will go down forever. And so you will have typically a num number of records which is of order one. But you can actually have, um, yeah, all the exponents that you that 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 you want. In fact, uh, yeah, it's it's quite tunable. <laughs> Yeah. One number square root of k, yeah. That's true. But you see that uh, you are summing these this numbers, OK? You have a sum of, so this, this rk are, are smaller. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, I have excluded because it is diverging here, so I cannot have a. It's a number, it's of order one. I'm looking at what happens for square root of n. I mean, I'm looking at the leading behavior. OK, there will be some corrections. It turns out that here there are some corrections, which are of order one. So this number, for instance, the case k equal to 0, of course, it exists, it's 1. But it will contribute to the constant, right? And I don't want to, to, to get the constant here. I could do it because I have an explicit formula, and I could, I could obtain it here easily. OK, but you have to, to convince yourself that uh, when you want to do the large n, here you just need to consider what happens in the limit of large k. Is that clear? Yes. OK, so you remember that this was the case for the Brownian motion, but not for the, not for the random walk, OK? Because there was this problem for the Brownian motion that essentially when you cross a zero, I mean, when Brownian motion, which is continuous both in space and time, when it crosses zero, then it will recross it infinitely many times. So, this should, so, so that means that in that case, the survival probability at x not equal to 0 should be 0 for the, indeed, for Brownian motion, but not for the random walk. That's true of the continuum limit of this, of this, of this object. OK? Other questions? OK. So now, now we want to, to do something uh, uh, more elaborated. I mean, we want to know more. Uh, we want to compute, say, the, OK, for instance, uh, we, could, we would like to compute the higher moments, second moments, for instance, uh, or uh, even the second moments. If you think, think a little bit about the second moment, uh, then you will realize that what we did before for the IID case uh, is much more difficult to do here. So you remember that for the, the IID case, so if you want to compute Rn square average, then you see that you will have this kind of correlation, sigma k, sigma k prime, to compute. And if you think a little bit uh, about, for, for, about this quantity for the random walk, it will be much harder. I mean, you have already seen that to derive the spar Andersen was already quite complicated. OK, we were using this uh, polarjack spitzer formula. And now you are asking for something even more complicated. You want to have uh, the records rate at two different times. So this, would be, this could be doable, but it would take, uh, I mean, quite some time. And instead, uh, we will develop an approach which allows us to get immediately the, uh, to get immediately the, um, essentially the, the, the full distribution of Rn. So before, uh, before doing that, I just want to give you, uh, okay, uh, here you see I use the fact that um, for symmetric jumps, you can use this, uh, this uh, Spar-Andersen theorem that I, that, I, that I told you. Uh, now, it turns out that uh, suppose that the, the jumps are not symmetric anymore for 
various reasons, if you, if you have put a drift or uh, if the, the distribution itself is different. Well, it turns out that there is a generalized Parandersen formula, and I just want to give it to you because it's, it's very nice. So basically, uh, this Q minus K, in fact, can be computed uh, for any jumps, whether, uh, which are continuous, at least. So it's uh, just a remark here, which is the generalized Parandersen. So generalized in which sense? In the sense that uh, now you suppose that uh, P of eta is continuous again. Mm, yes, it's continuous, uh, but not necessarily symmetric. So you relax this assumption. OK, so then in that case, uh, you have actually uh, a nice, very, again, a nice, very nice formula, in fact. So you remember that the Sparandersen formula came from this generating function. Uh, actually, the, what you get usually is a result for this guy. Okay, so Q minus K is quite complicated. I mean, it's, it's an object that really involves the full story, if you want, of the, the full history of the, of the random walk. And uh, in fact, you can, you can write it in this way, so uh, let me just write it and then I will comment. You can write it as a sum from, when, from m equal 1 to infinity of uh, 1 over m z to the m now times the probability that uh, your uh, random walk here, xk, is negative at step k. Okay, so that's okay. It looks a little bit uh, like a strange formula when you see it for the first time. But what is quite nice in this formula is that you are relating here on the left hand side a probability that again concerns the whole history of your random walk from step zero to step k. I mean, the survival pro to, to, to know whether uh, your particle have survived or not, you really need to know all the positions from step zero to step k. Now on the other, on the other side here, the only input that you have to give is the probability that your random walk is negative at step k only. So that's purely local in time, right? Here, I mean, you just need to know whether your, pro, your, your random walk is positive or negative uh, and with, with which probability. So let's just, so now in principle, this will, this can be uh, anything if you have uh, uh, jump distributions which are uh, not symmetric. Now let's see that we can recover this. How do you recover this formula uh, when you have continuous jump, symmetric jump? Now for symmetric jumps, obviously the probability to be positive or negative at step k is just half. Yes. The sum on the left side is from k equals zero to infinity. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. It's m. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. So if you have symmetric jumps, right? I mean, the probability to be positive or be negative is just the same. It's just half. Okay. So I can replace in this sum here half, and then the series are recognized that this is just the Taylor uh, series of uh, log, right? So in that case, uh, we get an identity, which is that the k from zero to infinity, q minus k z to the k is what? Is this exp exponential of? So here I just replace it by half. Okay, and now this sum here, the sum from m equal to one or z to the m divided by m is just minus log of one minus z. Okay, so that's just minus half of log of one minus z. Okay, just the sum. 
Now this exponential minus half of log is just one over square root of one minus z, and this is what we have. Okay. So this is just one divided by square root of one minus z. You remember it? So that's how I gave you the spar Anderson formula. That's how we derived it from this polar x pizza. Okay? Now once you have that, you have immediately this. But otherwise, if it's not half, then it's something else. Okay. So that means that with this formalism here, you can, for instance, uh, look at the case of the, suppose that you have a linear drift, for instance. Uh, so you put a force on your random walk, uh, and then you can study uh, what, will the, what will be the statistics of the number of frequents. Okay. So this is something uh, we have done a couple of years ago, and it's uh, quite No, 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 it's really xm. But you see that if you, if you take eta m's which are uh, symmetric, so take a collection of random variables, uh, eta i's, which are symmetric. That means that they, the probability that they are positive is exactly the, the probability that they are negative. If you take a sum of these random variables, it will also be symmetric. Take Gaussian variables which are centered at zero. If you take a sum of them, we know it will be a Gaussian, and it will also be, it will be clearly centered uh, around zero. Is that clear? It's because they are IID, yes, yeah. But in fact, if they are, well, in fact, if they are, uh, because, it's because what, uh, it's because, yeah, okay, at least in this case, it's true. Yeah. Okay, well, it's, it should be, in any case, their value, the mean value is zero, right? I mean, uh, whatever these p of x i's are. They can be correlated, super correlated, whatever. Is that clear? When you sum a collection of random variables, you know that typically the typical sum will be zero, right? Take a, uh, I don't know, take a spin system, Ising, Ising model in the high TC, in, in the high, in the high uh, temperature phase. I mean, the spins have, uh, can be plus or minus with equal probability, essentially, at high temperature. And if you sum these spins to get the magnetization, obviously, in, on average, it will be zero, right? And the probability that it is positive is exactly the same that it is negative, right? The system is just invariant by, by a global inversion. That's the same here. Okay? So you can change eta i in minus eta i, and the random walks will be exactly the same. That's another way of saying it. Fine? OK. So now uh, let's go to uh, something more. Uh, I mean, yeah, we just look at this uh, first moment here. So now let's look at uh, something, I mean, more complete. We want now to have the full statistics of this Rn. And I will show you uh, an approach which I have not really touched, which I have not touched upon too much uh, up to now, uh, which is called the renewal, the renewal structure of the random walk. And I will use this renewal approach uh, to compute this. And instead of computing only, and that's something quite general actually, in many cases, uh, so you want to extract the number of records, so it looks like a bit complicated object. So instead of that, you will consider uh, probability of a much, I mean, a much higher uh, object. That means here, essentially, I will compute the probability of the number of records and all the sizes of the ages. So I will consider very big object. But you will see that this very big object actually has a very nice expression. So, okay. So I want to have the statistics of Rn, the full statistics, I should say, uh, full distribution. I was just mentioning statistics. Uh, okay, let's call it renewal approach. That will be. <laughs> okay, so uh, it starts like that. It starts with a picture. Let's start with a picture which is similar to this one. And let me define the objects that I want to, to consider now. So I start at zero. 
And okay, I just uh, will just have this this kind of random walks that I did. No, it's not an approximation. Yes. Well, if you look at uh, okay, there are two things. I think you are mis you are, you are confusing two things. First thing is that if you really look at the average of this value, it will not be zero exactly, but the probability that is positive is exactly the same as the probability that it is negative. Right? You, you don't like it, I can see that uh, you are not convinced by that. <laughs> uh, you have to convince you. No, it's not an approximation, actually. It's, it's really exact. So take two, I don't know, uh, how, how can you convince uh, yourself of that? Uh, in a simpler way, you can take, uh, yeah, take two random variables, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Plus, minus, plus one, minus one. Just take two of them. Okay, and you make the sum. Okay, so there will be some probability that it is that is one. It can be one, or it can. Okay, if, if you look at the different probabilities, construct your your different probabilities that you might have, and obviously it will be symmetric. Again, here that's the same. The question that you you have to realize something. Uh, if I take symmetric jumps, and if I look at the the random walk, which is x i equal to x i minus one plus eta i, so this is one first random walk. Now with the same eta i's. I look at a different random walk, which is the xi is equal to xi minus 1 minus eta i. Okay. Then these are actually the same random walks. You have to. Okay. See, of course, they will not look the same, right? I mean, if you really run them, they, they will be different. One will be uh, minus the other one. But statistically, they are just the same, right? Because the distribution of eta i is just, this, is, is just symmetric. So I have the same probability to observe plus eta i and minus eta i, exactly. So this is really not an approximation here, right? So if the, if the, the, the jumps are symmetric, uh, this probability uh, will be exactly half. <clears throat> okay, so I look at this, uh, at this sequence and uh, I want to now define properly uh, various quantities. So there are these guys that we know well now. These are our records, okay? I have some records here. But now I want to uh, look also at the ages of, the, of these records, okay? So the ages will be basically this, uh, these guys, okay? So uh, I will define the age of this first record here as the number of, step, the number of steps that I needed to break it. So here, typically, uh, I will call it tau 1. So tau 1, here I have 1, 2, 3, 4 steps. So tau counts the number of steps. OK, this is how I define the ages. You see, there are two, in principle, two different ways of defining the, the ages. Either I count the steps, or either I count the number of points here. OK, there are some subtleties with that. So I will just count the number of steps here for all these ones. <coughs> So here I have a first, first one, here I have tau 2, which is 1, 2, 3 steps. Uh, now I have another one, tau 3, sorry, tau 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 steps, 1, 2, 6, and here I have another uh, random walk, 1, 2, 3, 4, that would be tau 5, which is 4 steps. So you see that, and here I have my final, my final, uh, final. So I have n steps here. I start at x naught here, and n counts the number of steps. Okay. We found out to count in steps. So you see that. So I have some. I have these objects here. Now you see that uh, I have finally another guy here. So I, I look at uh, what happens on a finite time interval capital N. So there is a last interval here, which is a bit singular, singular in the sense that it's not exactly the same one as 
uh, as the tau, and I will comment on that, and I will call it a n, and this is just here, one, two, three, four, five. I just also count the number of steps. But I want to draw your attention on the following thing, that the following properties. So basically, you see, I mean, all these quantities, these tau, these tau here, these tau i's, they are essentially all the same type of variables, right? Because how, do I, how are they defined? You see that I started at zero, and this tau one is the first time that I broke, that I passed or crossed this initial value, okay? Now the same here. What is this tau two? Is basically I have a random walk, and after time tau two, I just pass through this or cross this value again for the first time and again, okay? So you have this kind of uh, excursions, okay? This one, each of these, of these portions here, they are called excursions, okay? These taus, sorry? <laughs> okay. Tau three is here. Thank you. Okay, so I have uh, some collection of excursions here. So again, you, you need to see that I, I, it's like I have just glued this, uh, this uh, different excursions of uh, uh, Brownian motion where I started, say, at zero, and I looked at when I crossed the origin for the first time from the negative side. So you have always this, this picture here. Now, of course, here, this, this one is different simply because the, the, the last record plays a singular uh, role uh, with, with respect to the others simply because this one has never been broken by definition. Okay? It will be broken at some point here later with probability one, we know, for, for the random walk. But uh, this one is an unfinished excursion. Okay? So this, these are excursions. This one is an unfinished excursion. Okay? So what I want to compute really is the joint distribution of all these guys, okay? So I want to compute, so that's the, the question, the goal. Uh, I want to compute the joint probability that basically uh, tau one is equal to L1, tau two, these are all discrete numbers, huh? is equal to L2. Now the last guy here, uh, the last guy here, in gener generically the index of this guy will be tau of index Rn minus one, so let's check it. So we have one, two, three, four, five records. Our n is five. And the index of this last guy will always be tau r n minus one. You can just figure this out. And I want finally that this a n is equal to some value, say a. Let's see whether I really use this notation. Yes, fantastic. And I want also jointly that uh, the number of records is equal to n. So that's a very big object. And now in principle, when I have constructed this, basically I can compute the distribution of our n, our n solely by summing over these random variables, okay? So maybe uh, I have to make some comments on this, on the values of, this, of these numbers here. Well, you see that uh, these LIs here, they need to be larger than one. I mean, if they are not larger than one, they don't mean anything. That means that there was no excursion. So LI has to be larger than one. But if you think a little bit about it, the value of A here can be zero. Okay, so imagine that you break the records at the last step, then A n will just be zero. Okay, so that means that A can actually be zero. Okay, and that corresponds to a situation where you break the record at the last step. Okay, so A itself can be positive. They are all integers, of course. Eh? For a run discrete random walk, these are all integers. And then I need to compute, and, and M, obviously, M also is, uh, I mean, has to be greater or equal than one, sorry. Because this one, by definition, is always a record. Okay? So question is, how do I compute that? Well, uh, 
the computation of these of this, uh, big objects essentially, I mean, relies on two properties and two tools, okay? So the two tools, the tools that we have them already, I will recall them in a, in a minute. And now what are these two properties? Well, the first property is that the random walk is a Markov process, and as a consequence, all these variables, tau i's and i n's, are just independent, right? That should be quite clear from the Markov property of the random walk. So the Markov uh, RW is, the random walk is RW for random walk. Uh, is Markov, Markovian, and as a consequence, you see, I mean, when you are here, the length of this, uh, of this excursion here obviously will be completely independent of what happened before. Just because this guy here doesn't know anything about what happened before okay. when he jumps. So, that means that uh, the tau i's and a n are actually independent. So this is almost true, and in fact they are almost independent. So why is it so? Well, there is a little constraint on this uh, on these guys, is that their sum actually has to be exactly equal to n, okay? Because I fixed n, and so obviously tau 1 plus tau 2 plus tau 3 plus tau 4 plus a n must be equal to n exactly. And that, of course, obviously induces some constraint on these random variables. But that's the only constraint that they have, okay? So uh, you need to have uh, almost is because of that. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, no. Why do you say so? Uh, you can you can see it as a function. Okay, you can see. Yeah, it's a n. But then, okay, you, 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 if you want. But this what I wrote here can also be viewed as a, as a condition on a n, right? You would like to write. You asked the question. Oh, sorry. Uh, this a n here is just n minus the tau i's, and that actually creates. Uh, Obviously, some correlations between the ANs and the other tau i's, right? Yeah, I mean, think, think about it as you wish, but uh, it's important at least to see that as a whole that there is some correlations between them, and uh, the correlations indeed is that AN must fill the gap up to N. That, that's, I think, equivalent for, for at least for, for this purpose. Yeah, I, I said almost, again, because of this global constraint, okay? Because there is a global constraint, and we will see that it plays a role. Of course, when n is very large, this constraint is not very strong, but still it's there. So that's the first thing. Now, the other property is that we know that the random walk uh, is invariant under translation, okay? So that means that if typically, I mean, if you look at a random walk that starts at x naught equal to 10, or a random walk that starts at x naught equal to 100, uh, if you just renormalize them, translate them uh, to start at zero, then they will be exactly the same, statistically. So in other words, uh, this uh, random walk is invariant under translation, And that means that if you look at the, dis the, the probability distribution of tau 1, for instance, so tau 1, again, you start at 0 here, and you look at the first passage through x naught, through the initial point here, which is 0 in that case. So this is one guy. But now here you are seeing, I can just view this part here, this excursion here, as a translation of this one, but uh, I could imagine that instead of starting at this point here, I could have a random walk that starts exactly at zero, and again, 
I would like what's the probability that I cost zero for the first time. Okay? So what I want to, to say is that because this random walk is invariant under translation, basically these tau i's are just identical. Okay? They are just the same random, so the, they are just the realization of the same uh, random variable, a different realization of the same random variable. So these tau i's are identically distributed. Say it like this. That's clear? Right? Okay, so now uh, I need uh, some tools. Uh, to I need two tools, basically. Uh, and I should have uh, divided, okay, this blackboard here is a bit, okay, my, my picture is a bit big, but it's nice to, to have it because otherwise it's very hard to figure out what we are doing. So, okay, uh, let me just, Erase this, I just want to have it, uh, I just want to, I will just have it that uh, tau i's and a n are almost independent. Okay, now I want to have uh, two property, two tools to that. Okay, so they are independent and we should Remind us that, uh, that we have this uh, this constraint. Okay. So this almost uh, refers to that. Okay. Now, what are the two tools uh, that we have? Is n yes? Sorry. Thank you. So what are the two tools that, uh, the tools that we need? Okay. Well, these are the tools to compute these values. So what, what, what we want to compute is really the probability distribution of these tau i's and a n's. Okay, so we need to think a bit of what tau i is and what a n is, okay? So in other words, uh, what we know now from this, uh, we know the following. We know that this joint distribution here, which I don't want to write, but we have already a partial answer to it, which is simply that this will be, uh, let me call it f of uh, li, f of l1, f of l2, f of uh, L R N minus one. Okay, so that's roughly speaking uh, what I want to have. So let me just uh, define the two tools that we will need. So the first one is this guy. Okay, so I, I want to I want to compute basically the probability that tau i is equal to L i, and that's f of L i. So this is the first quantity that I want to, to compute, okay? And on top of that, uh, I will have, in addition, the probability that a n is equal to a. So that's, that will be something, the second quantity that I want to get, the probability that a n is equal to a. So we will, we will see how we can compute that. And so this is what I say by saying they are almost independent. But now I, have, I should have a, a delta function here, Kronecker function, that imposes that uh, tau 1 plus tau Rn minus 1 plus A. Sorry. This is uh, a condition on the, on the Li's, excuse me. So that would be delta of L1 plus L R n minus one plus a, and this has to be equal to n. Okay, can you read that? So this is just a delta Kronecker function. Okay, so it's zero if the two arguments are different, and this is one if they are the same. So I want, okay, you, you know this notation? Delta ij? Okay. Yes? 
this is 1 if i is equal to j, and this is 0 if i is different from j. Okay, so here I need to have, so I need to have the global sum here, which is exactly equal to n, and that's what, that's what it counts. Yeah, sure. So the, yeah, again, so they, they, they are independent because these are, this is a renewal approach. I mean, this is a renewal theorem. The random walk satisfies this. And this is called the renewal theorem, basically. The fact that at each time you have cost the, the, the zero here, essentially you can forget about what happened before and you restart. Okay. But nevertheless, since I'm working here, so you could, I mean, that means that, okay, you could say, I, I'd never, I never stop. I mean, you could look at the random walk that, 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 that are really on the infinite horizon, as, 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 as mathematicians would say. So you set n goes to infinity, and that will eventually converge to something which might have a good limit. Now, here I'm doing a bit something else. I want to, to, uh, to, to look at what happens uh, after n steps. This one? This, the, the last, this last delta here? Yeah, it's not very well. Uh, yeah, it's not. So I will actually then it's better for me to use a different, slightly different notation because this index. So I will use this notation: delta of i comma j. Yeah, yeah. This this you you cannot read. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's because it's a subscript, so that's not very nice. So I will just I, I forget about. I will use this instead this notation. So this will be delta of uh, l1 plus l2 ta ta ta. L R N minus one plus A N. That's important. Is that fine? To yeah. write what? Well, I mean that they are independent except for the constraint. You have IID random variables, but you fix the constraint. That's just, it's a, I mean, it's, a, it's almost a definition, I would say. What is, uh, I mean, once you have that, so once you know that these tau i's and these a n's are independent, which is granted by the fact that you have a Markov chain, nevertheless, you have this, this is the only thing that correlates this guy. The only, the other way that you, that you can uh, think about it, I mean, as your, uh, uh, as you were mentioning before, you can remove this guy if you want, this delta, and simply say that a n has to be uh, n minus the rest. Okay, this is another way of, of saying it, right? And again, that that's just the same. But you will see that technically it's much nicer to to write the thing with a delta function. You will see this in a moment. So now, uh, what I want to uh, to compute is this f. So maybe I should have actually f minus. That that's better. I will use the notation f minus because it's related to q minus. I suppose you have noticed it. Okay, the probability, so f minus li, we have already uh, seen it, right? Because this is just this probability, right? Let me just write this, uh, this small uh, cartoon here. You start at zero and you do this random walk and exactly at step between li minus one and li, you cross zero for the first time. Okay, so that's, this is Li, this is Li minus one, you start at zero, and this is what uh, we have already computed, which is the first passage probability from below. So this is the first, first passage probability. Okay. You remember that? We had seen that. Now, this you remember probably also that this first passage probability, I can actually relate it to the survival probability. Ooh, the vertical, axis is Vertical axis is xi, is x, basically, is x. Okay, so it's time, so it's space here. Let's do it like this, it's space, space and time. Okay, so I, I've just picked one of these segments here, okay? I just I'm looking just at, at this segment here. What I'm saying is that the length, so again, what is tau i? 
tau i is defined as the first passage time through your initial point, okay? And you want to know the distribution of this guy. So I just isolated one of these pieces here, one of these excursions, so that's this one. I started at zero, but you can start anywhere else. I said that because it's translation invariant. So you start at zero, and you want to compute the probability that you recross zero from below for the first time between step Li minus one and step Li. That's the definition, okay? So what I claim is that this probability is exactly this first passage probability, right? Now this first passage probability, we have seen it. You can view it as a minus the discrete derivative of the survival probability. So in other words, this F minus of Li, you can write it as Q minus uh, Li minus one. Okay, let's do it better, because you won't see anything here. So we have seen Q minus. So it's Q minus Li minus one minus Q minus Li. Would you buy that? Okay, so we have seen that already uh, several times, but okay, you, not several times, probably one time. But if you don't like it, I mean, you have the right, and uh, I can re-explain it, but tell me. Okay, so again, one way, one way maybe to, to, to see that is that the Q minus, uh, Q minus is uh, the, the survival probability. So if you look at Q minus K, well, a way to see that you have survived up to, up to step k, well, this, another way to say it is that you have recrossed the origin for the first time after step k plus one. So q minus k is just the probability from L equal k plus one to infinity of F minus L. Okay, that's another way of saying it, okay? So that means that if you have not crossed the origin up to step, up to step k, well, that means that you have recrossed it after. Okay, that's exactly that, uh, what I'm saying. And we know that this probability is finite, so I can go up to infinity. And this probability is basically the sum of the probabilities, or basically the, the probability that the first passage time is strictly larger than k. Okay, that's. So I have this, this identity. So once you have this, if you buy that, then you should be able to derive this. Is that fine for this object? So that's the first brick, the first building block, because we have many of them here. And now, uh, what I need uh, is the, the no, I need to treat separately the case of a n. So a n, what's what is a n? Well, a n, you see, it's it's quite simple. In fact, let's just isolate what a n is on this small on a small graph here. So I have this Q minus K here. So let's see, uh, this, is the, this is the first tool, this is the second tool. I want to have a similar graph. Now you see, I mean, for this last part, this one is a record. By definition, is the last record. That means that after him, after it, all the values need to be lower than, it, than this guy. So in other words, on this, last segment of step a n, I have a random walk that starts, say, at zero and stay negative up to step a n. And that's, again, a survival probability. Okay. So the low, I mean, the probability that a n is exactly equal to a, well, this is just q minus of a. Again, because uh, I'm just looking at these kind of things. I have a random walk that starts it starts here, I don't know where, but I don't care because I'm saying that uh, this segment here is a, an independent, I mean, is a walk which is essentially independent from the rest. And it starts only at, uh, the only thing is that it starts at this point here, but since the random walk is translationally invariant, I can just start at zero. And uh, what it does here, the probability that the an is equal to a is just that uh, I, I have this kind of, uh, of thing here, of step a. 
Okay, so I need to stay negative up to step A. So it's very nice because uh, essentially I've, I know what it is. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so where is it? Yeah, it's in the sum and it's on this index here. Index means the number of these guys that I have, okay? Yeah, I can replace it by M, actually, if you prefer. Yeah, maybe it's better. Uh, okay, it's, it's the same here, but yes, I, I can replace it by M if you want. Yeah, maybe it's better to do that. Okay, yeah, you're right. This RN here, I mean, in this case, okay, I'm mixing a bit uh, uh, the random variable and its value which physicists usually don't mind to do, but uh, which mathematicians do you don't, don't like. So the dependence on M, so M is the number of records indeed, is basically in this number of factors here and also in the, in the delta function here. That's a good question. But that's the only way it enters. Okay? So now we want to, uh, to extract now, in principle, we, all the, the information is, 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 is in, this, uh, in this guy here. Of course, it's a little bit uh, complicated, uh, but we will see that it actually has a quite nice, uh, quite nice structure. So let's see how it works. So now I can erase this. I think that I, uh, I hope that I could convince you that uh, this joint distribution is given by that. Okay. So. Because of this delta function, uh, you see, if I think a little bit at this model uh, in the context of statistical mechanics, it's a bit like I, I am, if, if you think about this segment as the, number, as the number of particles, you see that this delta function actually imposes me to work in a kind of canonical ensemble. Okay. And usually, I mean, we don't like too much to work in a canonical ensemble. In that case, it's much easier because n, you see, I mean, here somehow can, can vary here. It's much better to let n vary precisely and to work in the grand canonical ensemble. Okay. So the grand canonical ensemble is just a generating function of the uh, partition function of the canonical ensemble. So I will do that. I will take the generating function of this guy with respect to n. And you will recover something which is similar to the grand canonical ensemble. Okay. So that's a remark. That's one way to... Uh, to, to so I look, I, I have now a joint law of these uh, LIs, if you want. I will just uh, notice like this. I have uh, A and I have M. Okay, it's a big object. And I don't like it too much because that this delta function is a bit, is a bit annoying. So I have this, okay, this uh, F minus of L1, F minus of L m minus 1, q minus a, and I have this delta. So another way of, 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 of looking at it, if you want, uh, is to say that uh, I have a certain convolution, in fact, of this law. Right? I can view that as a kind of convolution, if you want. And uh, what turns out to be much uh, nicer to work with uh, is actually uh, is generating function. So. <clears throat> Why do I do that? Because uh, eventually, uh, so let's stick for the moment with that. What I want to compute is I would like to know the, the, the distribution of M. Okay? So my goal is to, to obtain, obtain this guy. Okay? This is this probability. I, want, I could ask other questions from all this. I could look at the ages of the records. Of course, I will not do that today. I just want to look at the number of records starting from this renewal. Maybe this, this, this product here, the fact that I have a product here, uh, is, has a, this is called the renewal structure. And it's extremely powerful. It can be generalized to other stochastic processes, some others. So what is that? I mean, to get it, you would agree, I guess, that I need to sum over all the possible values of A, L, and A. 
So that's uh, what I, I need to do in principle. I want to sum from 1 to infinity. Uh, I need to sum to infinity of this uh, f minus L1. Sorry, I have an additional sum to perform. Excuse me. And this additional sum, uh, yeah, let's write it this way. I have to sum from a equal to 0. You remember that this li start at 1, but a can be 0 also of this, of this quantity. F, of f, f minus of L1, F minus of L, M minus 1, Q minus of A, and I have this delta function. So again, it's really now a convolution of this, uh, of this, of this different laws. Now, as I said, uh, I don't like too much this delta function, which enforces me to work somehow in the, in the canonical ensemble, which is uh, usually quite hard. So what I will do is I will take some generating function with respect to n. So I will start at 0, and I will compute this guy instead. Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, OK. Yeah, OK, maybe I should have not said that. Um, so physically uh, it's it you can think of of this of this uh, of this delta function to con think a bit about the blocks that i have in my system i want to to think about them as uh, some particle number some particles each block is a particle okay uh, now for some reason i mean uh, you see that uh, this constrains me uh, to have or, or say say differently uh, in each block i have a certain number of particles which is li's and a and I want that the total number of, of particles is exactly equal to n, OK? So it's a little bit constraining, because if you think, I mean, if I ask you, I mean, please evaluate the sum here. They are quite intricated. I don't like too much this constraint. So I will say, OK, let's forget about it. I will just work in the grand canonical ensemble, and I will introduce some chemical potential. Okay? My chemical potential here is. Uh, so you, you, you might think as Z as a fugacity. So as Z, I, I could think, it, think about it as exponential beta mu. Okay, this is an analogy, right? And then I will have exponential of n beta mu. Okay? And if you sum n over n, then you switch from the canonical partition, partition function in the canonical to the partition function in the grand canonical. Okay? Again, one has to have, it's, I think it's nice to think that the, the the, the, the grand canonical ensemble is basically the generating function of the canonical ensemble in some sense, because it's very useful to think about it in this term. Uh, and this gives you also a nice tool here. Why do you do that? Uh, obviously, because when you now sum, so this is just a remark. I mean, if you don't like this, uh, this analogy with the, with the grand canonical ensemble, forget about it. I like it, but uh, I think it's useful. But if you don't like it, you have the right. It, it's not really useful, not necessary, I would say. It is useful, but not, uh, yes, OK. So let's, uh, so now you see that I have to do this sum from n equal to 0 to z to the n. So that's what I need to sum now, OK? So it looks complicated, but in fact, it's quite simple. It is quite simple because of this delta function here. Because you see that the sum over n here it's, it's quite simple, right? The sum over n will just give me that uh, I have z to the power L1 plus L2 plus L3 plus, plus A. So what I claim is that, that I can do the sum over, over z to the n, and uh, I will write it, it will come that li like that, right? So I have a sum of L1 then I have a sum over Ln minus 1 which starts from 1 to infinity. And then I have uh, a sum over, OK, let's do it, sum over, still a sum over A from 0 to infinity. And then, OK, I have this F minus L1, F minus L, M minus 1, Q minus A. But then you see, I mean, Z to the N times the delta function and sum over N then the only possible values that it selects 
are precisely the n which are equal to L1 plus L2 plus Lm minus 1 plus A. Okay? And now life becomes much, much nicer because I have, okay, I have a huge number of sums here, but I have the sum of products which can be rewritten as the product of the sum, right? Because they are completely decoupled. So what I'm saying is that the sum over L1, the sum over Lm minus 1, the sum over A equals 0 are just completely decoupled. So in other words, this, I can again rewrite it like that. Let me collect what depends on L1. What depends on L1 are just this F1, F minus L1 times Z to the power L1. That's the first block. Now let's look at L2. Well, L2 is basically the same, right? To infinity, F minus L2, Z to L2. You agree? And the same for this L M minus 1, which goes from 1 to infinity of L M minus 1 Z L index minus 1. I'm almost done. I still have one guy, which is the sum over A. Okay? Now the sum over A, I can... So you see that they, they, they do factorize. I mean, that's the key point of using this one canonical or this generating function, is that here I had a very intricate constraint, but in the, in the Laplace, how I say, in the generating function space, uh, it becomes extremely simple. Is that fine? But now, in fact, all these objects are just the same because L1 or L2 are just dummy variables here. So at the end of the day, I obtain something very nice. So I will introduce this. Yeah, I just need to keep that in the corner because I uh, just want to see, to tell you something at some point. Uh, now I can't. So what I'm saying is that this is, okay. These are all the same values, the same functions here. And these functions, they, on top of that, they have a nice interpretation. They are just the generating function of these objects. So this guy is the generating function of F minus L1, or F minus L, and this one is the generating function of Q minus, which we know, actually. Spar Anderson tells us exactly what this guy is. So we have a nice expression. Let me write it like this. So we know that the generating function of this uh, probability z to the n is what? Okay, I'm writing it and I will comment. I will write it this guy, q minus z to the power m minus 1, sorry, f tilde minus, and here I will have a q minus to the power z. Now, what are these guys? So these guys are just the generating function. It's just the sum from L equal to 1 to infinity of F minus L, Z to the L, and Q tilde minus Z is just the sum from A equal to 0 to infinity of Q minus A, Z to the A. So at the end, it's very simple. I mean, simple. You see, I mean, we, work, we had to work a little bit, but eventually... So we had, that was a good idea to, to consider a, a much bigger object, and that's something that is very frequent, actually, when you want to compute some marginals. So you isolate some objects, you want to compute the distribution of this object, you easily realize, or quickly realize that it's, it will be quite strong because it's a, it looks like a quite intricate object. Now you need to see precisely on what it depends, and then you will compute the full distribution of all the variables on which the number of records uh, depend, and from it, by successive integration or summation here, you obtain what you want. And at the end of the day, 
uh, with the use of these generating function techniques, you have something very simple. So now what I want to say is that it's even simpler here because uh, we are considering symmetric jumps. And this is very simple. This is given by Spar Andersen. And Spar Andersen just tells you that this is just this guy. Okay. Now what about this one? Well, this one, you see, is also very simple. It's very simple because S minus, F minus Z is just related to that. Okay? So it's very simple because it's just, okay. It turns out that this is just that. Okay, so this is Par Andersen. I hope you recognize it. Now, this is a consequence of Spar Andersen. So, how do I see that? I just need to use this identity here. Let's do it just some exercise. <clears throat> and then we will have a beautiful formula. Very simple. And you again, you see that the only thing that we really need is this Q minus. So, I told you, I mean, this. Uh, up to now, I mean, the only thing that I needed to compute everything that I, that, I, that I had was this Q minus. So what I say is that here, this is also basically the same. Because if I want to look at F tilde minus of Z, then this is just this guy, right? This is the sum of F minus L Z to the L. Now, I just replace this. Uh, or these are standard identities when you manipulate generating functions. Huh? So this S F minus L, you see I can still write it as Q minus L minus 1 minus Q minus of L, Z to the L. Is that fine? So let's, let's see what it, what, what it gives. So you see here, so I just separate the two sums. They are converging. Uh, uh, because of the z, z is smaller than 1. So the radius of convergence is, uh, is fine. I mean, and then, okay, I want to write this first term as, uh, I can write it this way. I, let me take a z outside, and let's write it as z to the power l minus 1, q minus l minus 1. This is the first term here. And then I have a second term. The second term is this sum here, is the sum from l equal 1 to infinity, of Q minus L, Z to the L. Okay, didn't do so much. Now, I will do two things. Here, I will just change the, in the index and set L prime is equal to L minus 1. Okay, so this is just the sum from L prime equal 0 to infinity of Z to the power L prime Q minus L prime. I just made a shift, translation of the index. Okay, so this I know. This is just Par Andersen. Okay, now what about this guy? Well, this guy, you see, it's almost, uh, if I look at that, it's almost given by Par Andersen, but there is just one term which is missing, which is the terms which corresponds to L equal to zero. Okay, so we just have this term for zero. So that would be Q minus of zero minus uh, the sum z to the 0 is 1. OK, and now I can use par Andersen. So that is z times that. Now q minus so 0 is the probability that uh, starting at 0 that I survive. So that's 1. This is just 1. And then this is uh, simply. Uh, So if I isolate the one, and if I just sum these two guys, well, you obtain what I wrote before. OK? So that's essentially uh, disguised par Andersen also. Right? So this guy has computed everything for us, and now Basically, we are we are ready to. Well, then we can compute anything we want, okay? Because uh, I mean, 
it's not yet depends a bit on what you really want, but okay. <laughs> I'm almost done now. I mean, I'm almost, I, ar I arrived at least at uh, this generating function. Okay, so let's write it explicitly. So that's, that's the final result of, of this bit long calculation, but at the end, relatively simple. I mean, of course, that's when, when you see it for the first time, uh, uh, it's a bit, uh, okay, it might, it might uh, appear a bit uh, cumbersome. Uh, I did it uh, quickly because I've done that 100 times. So, I mean, okay, I see how it works, but. Uh, but that's, sorry. So that's the formula that we have, okay? And now, if you work a little bit more, you can extract this distribution, okay? So you need to work out what is P of Rn equal to M. So here it's a little bit more complicated. So if you want to, so in principle, how you do, I mean, the answer is, is hidden here. What you need to do, if you really want to compute this guy, if you want to compute the probability that Rn is equal to M, then you need to expand this series in powers of Z, and you look at the coefficient of the series, uh, the coefficient of the term of the Z to the M. So in principle, with Mathematica, for instance, you could do this very simply. And if you are a bit more clever, uh, you can actually guess analytically what this guy will be, for instance, using the uh, Cauchy's formula uh, that I gave last time. So I, maybe I can just show you what this, the final formula, the formula is. And this, this is again, uh, this was again, I think, the first time probably a at least for the records uh, obtained by uh, Majundar and Zif. Uh, and this is this, uh, this nice, uh, okay, you have this very nice uh, combination. I mean, it's, it's, it's simple, in fact. Um, two to the power. So it, it turns out that in the probability lit literature, uh, this formula has also various uh, interpretations. Uh, I don't know. If you like the book by Feller, for instance, uh, you will see that uh, in Feller's book, there are this, this kind of formula actually appears. If you don't like Feller's book, okay, you have the right, uh, then uh, well, you can work, work it out by yourself or see other papers. Uh, Pittman, for instance, has many derivations of these uh, results uh, in a different context. Anyway. Uh, the way to do that is basically, I mean, a simpler way. You just expand this using the binomial coefficient, and you can just use Cauchy's formula for all the terms, and then you resum all the things. And using some nice properties of uh, uh, binomial coefficients, you arrive at this formula. So the question that uh, once you have that, you can compute everything. Then a nice question that you may ask uh, is what uh, I mean. What's the typical distribution in the large n limit? Okay. Now it turns out that. Uh, in the large n limit, uh, one can extract uh, the behavior of, of this, uh, of this uh, formula simply by using, for instance, a st Stirling formula, if you want. I mean, that's probably the easiest way uh, to get it when, once you have this, um, this expression. Of course, from it, you can recover first the first moment that we got. Uh, maybe I can just uh, mention that uh, quite quickly. Uh, otherwise, it will be a bit. Uh, so you have an explicit formula, and again, once you have it, uh, I want to understand the large n behavior of it. So what happens for large n? So as usual, I mean, a good way of un to understand the large n behavior, a good way to, to, to start, I mean, of course, if you do it blindly, I mean, this will lead nowhere. The first, I mean, a good way to, to understand how this distribution looks like when n is large it to is to look at the first moment. Now, we have seen already that Rn uh, is actually proportional to square root of n. And uh, we had this, uh, this coefficient here, this 2 over square root of pi. OK? Now, you can check this formula, of course, starting from that. So that means that you can sum over m times this probability. And then you can also get, once we have the, the full distribution, we can actually get Rn square, for instance. Or we could get this guy, the variance. 
Okay. Now, quite interestingly, uh, what you would find is that this is actually proportional to n. Okay. So, and not square root of n. So that means that, okay, I can uh, give you the coefficient. It's very simple. It's 2n. But so what you see is that in this case, and that's really at variance with what we observed for IID random variables, you see that the typical fluctuations is of order square root of n. And this is actually of the same order as the fluctuations. Okay, so if you compute that, okay, then this will be of that, that form. And that means that this actually is of the same order as square root of n. And that's quite different from what we observed in the IID case, because you remember that, uh, let me just recall it here. If I do the same for IID, we had Rn, uh, which was log n, fine. But we have Rn squared minus Rn squared, which was also log n. So in other words, if you do that, then you would get square root of log n. And that's what I mentioned by saying that this is instead much smaller than, than Rn itself. Okay? Okay, it's not very nice, but okay, but don't, don't write it because you don't. Need. So what I wanted to point, to point here is that the relative fluctuations are square root of, I mean, are square root of log n divided by log n. That means one over square root of log n. Here you see that the fluctuations are of the same order. So that means that the fluctuations in the random walk case are much stronger, okay? You break more records, uh, but the fluctuations of this number of records is also much, much, much stronger. So this actually, when you have something like that, when you have such a case where uh, essentially the, the width is of the same order as the, the mean value, and in fact what you can show is that if you go to the higher order cumulants, they will, of course, be all comparable to the initial value. So that suggests that uh, you should look at, or you would expect that this distribution takes a scaling form for large n, which is of that form, which is typically of 1 over square root of n times some function, say g naught j. Here we will not do the other one, m divided by square root of n. So that means that the typical value of m should, should scale like square root of n, and there is a 1 over square root of n simply for normalization. Okay. So j is a density, and I would expect that gen, so m is positive, so I would expect that this j of x is normalized. Okay. The question is, what is this j? Well, this j is actually a simple Gaussian here. Okay. It's a bit deceptive. Uh, but, okay, uh, that's the result of this computation. Uh, that means if you start from this formula, and if you like to use uh, scaling, okay, so here, I mean, how to do the, the, the asymptotics, uh, you, will just, you will just use this guy, no? I mean, you will just use that, which is square root of 2 pi n, exponential of n log n minus n. So if you just replace this uh, factorial here, by this Stirling formula, then what you will find is that g of x uh, is, is a simple Gaussian. So first it's, it's defined on the positive axis, and it's x squared divided by 4 divided by, I uh, can never remember, yeah, by 4. And it's normalized, so it, it, has, it is 1 over square root of pi. So in this case, what you see is that, uh, so j of x is what? Is a, is a half Gaussian. It's not really a Gaussian, it's a half Gaussian. So that means that, so the situation is, is quite different. I mean, okay, so this was the, this is the, so it's a half Gaussian. This is j of x. So now if I really look at, uh, just to finish, uh, just to compare what we had for the for the gamble, sorry, for the IID case and for the, the random walk. I can erase this. Just want to make a comparison uh, to to end up. So what 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 are the differences? How do they look like? So if I look at uh, say the random walk, 
and here I can look at the IID, IID case. So random walk, if I look at, uh, essentially if I look at the, the distribution of, I mean this probability as a function of n, what I will have is that this is centered, I mean this is close to zero actually, and it is basically like that. And the width here will be quite huge. The width here will be of order square root of n. That's what it says. That's what we have shown. And this function here is just this half Gaussian, okay? That I've computed here. I mean computed. This is this one. What about the IND case? Well, in the IND case, uh, things are quite different because that's how they look. So if I look at the probability that Rm is equal to m, of course this is this is a picture that you should have in the large n limit. Huh? I mean, I, I'm talking here about only large n. We have exact formulas for finite n if you want, but uh, I, I'm talking here about large n. So here what happens is that we have a Gaussian which is basically star-centered. So I have something like that. Okay, I, I'm, I'm cheating a bit because of course, the, the width will will grow, in fact, uh, but it's the relative width that, that is. Uh, so I will have something like that, right? We'll have a nice Gaussian, which will be centered around log n, and with a width which actually is very small, and it's of order square root of log n. Okay. So you see, I mean, the, 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 so this, this one is a Gaussian, it's a full Gaussian, and it's completely symmetric around log n. It's a full Gaussian, I mean, compared to the half Gaussian. Okay, now I let you this uh, as an exercise if you want. <laughs> uh, now it turns out that the number of records here is exactly as the number, that, that's exactly the distribution of the maximum of the random walk. Okay, if you remember, and that's actually not a coincidence. Uh, if you think a little, about, a little bit about it, uh, there is a direct, and for some random walk model, there is a direct mapping between the number of records and the maximum of the random walk. And this is actually true for the plus minus random walk. So if you look at the plus minus random walk, you just do uh, right or left steps with probability half. If you think a little bit about it, you can actually directly relate the number of records with the maximum of the random walk. And that's where this, uh, this analogy comes from. Okay, so this, uh, I mean, okay, I, I, of course, I treated a very uh, specific case, uh, the case of uh, discrete uh, time step uh, random walks, uh, which were symmetric. Uh, and I could show you how we can use these ideas essentially from first passage properties uh, to, to build uh, this full joint probability and ask various uh, nice, nice questions for this problem. There are many extensions around it. Um, well, most of the, I mean, the latest extensions, I mean, you will find a nice review uh, in this, uh, this review that, that I wrote with my colleagues, with uh, Claude Godrech and uh, Satya Majumdar. Uh, this has been extended to, to various type of uh, random walks, like continuous time random walks, which are quite popular uh, right now. Um, so there are many, many uh, things that can be done with this, uh, with this, uh, with this material. And I guess that, uh, yeah, I'm already late, I'm sorry. So, okay, with this I will let you. So, good luck for the rest of the, of the school. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.